Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Nanam Paramam Dheyam Knowledge is Supreme Let us now look at uh, the response to another important uh, input which is a sinusoidal input. So let us consider again the transfer function gs is kp over tau s plus 1 and uh, change in input will say is a sin omega t. Now note that uh, when we are writing this y and u, these are deviation variables. So we are always considering a deviation from a steady state. So let us say we give a sinusoidal input to this first order system, which has an amplitude of a and omega. So in that case, the Laplace transform of input will be a omega over s square plus omega square. So let us now see what is the effect of this. So we will have y s is equal to g s times u s and uh, we will have a k p times omega over tau s plus 1. s square plus omega square. So again we will have to use uh, partial fractions. So in this case we will be breaking up it up as a k p times alpha over tau s plus 1 plus beta s plus gamma over s square plus omega square. The reason for such kind of partial fraction is that uh, we already know the Laplace inverse of 1 over tau s plus 1 as e raised to minus a t. Now uh, we have also seen that uh, the Laplace of sine function will be omega over s square plus omega square. So there is not no function, there is a constant in the numerator and the denominator has s square plus omega square. So this gamma over s square plus omega square will give us some sinusoidal function and then the Laplace of cos of omega t is s over s square plus omega square. So this beta s over s square plus omega square will give us a cosine of a function in which we said is equal to a k p omega over tau s plus 1 s square plus omega square. So if we simplify this, the method of set of partial fractions, what we get is omega will be equal to alpha times s square plus omega square plus beta s plus gamma times tau s plus 1. So in order to get alpha, beta and gamma, we will have to use uh, different values of s. So let us say we take the value of s as minus 1 over tau. In that case the second term will go away and we can get the value of alpha. So that will give us alpha equal to tau square omega over 1 over tau square omega square. Now if we take s equal to 0. In that case, uh, we will get rid of beta, so we will have alpha and gamma and in that case we can substitute the value of alpha from this. So in that case we will get gamma which will be equal to omega over 1 plus 
tau square omega square and lastly we can substitute as equal to 1 in that case nothing will cancel out but we already know the values of gamma and alpha so we can get the value of beta which in this case will come out to be minus omega tau over 1 plus tau square omega square. So, we can substitute all these into the original equation and try to see how does the output looks like. So, we will get y s is equal to a k p omega tau square over 1 plus tau square omega square over tau s plus 1 plus minus omega tau s plus omega whole divided by 1 plus tau square omega square over s square plus omega square. Now, let us try to individually look at all the three terms. So, let us call this as term 1 this is term 2. So, term 1 is omega tau square over 1 plus tau square omega square over tau s plus 1 which we can again divide by tau on both sides. So, we will get tau omega over 1 plus tau square omega square times 1 over s plus 1 over tau. So, if we want to take the Laplace inverse of 1 that will be tau omega over 1 plus tau square omega square e raise to minus t over tau. So, let us look at the second term the second term is minus omega tau s plus omega over s square plus omega square into 1 over 1 plus tau square omega square. So, we will try to write it down as sines and cosines. So, which uh, we can write as 1 over 1 plus tau square omega square omega over s square plus omega square minus tau into omega tau into s over s square plus omega square. So, let us now look at the second term which we can say is, uh, so the second term is 1 over 1 plus tau square omega square times omega minus omega tau s over s square plus omega square which we can write as 1 over 1 plus tau square omega square times omega over s square plus omega square minus omega tau s over s square plus omega square. So, we know that Laplace inverse of omega over s square plus omega square is equal to sin of omega t and Laplace inverse of s over s square plus omega square is going to be cos of omega t. So, based on that what we get is the Laplace inverse 
of the second term is 1 over 1 plus omega square tau square times sin of omega t minus omega tau times cos of omega t. So now we will try to sort of simplify this term or condense this term. So we are working on Laplace inverse of 2 and we will try to uh, rearrange this as root of 1 plus tau square omega square and we will take the remaining root inside and we will write it as sin of omega t times 1 and then this additional root of 1 plus tau square omega square comes in here minus cos of omega t as it was there times omega tau over again root of 1 plus tau square omega square. So, what we have done is uh, we have split this 1 over 1 plus tau square omega square as multiples of root square root terms. So, that essentially the expression remains the same, but what we have gotten are these two new terms. which we are going to write. So, this we are going to write as cos of some angle phi and this we will be writing as sin of some angle phi. And as we can see the way we have rearranged is if we say sin square phi plus cos square phi we are going to get 1 plus tau square omega square over 1 plus tau square omega square which is equal to 1. So, this is a feasible uh, definition of phi and the way we can get phi is tan of phi will be equal to omega tau. So, phi will be equal to tan inverse of tau omega. So, based on this definition uh, what we get is the Laplace inverse of this second term is 1 over square root of 1 plus tau square omega square times sin of omega t cos phi minus cos of omega t sin phi which is equal to sin of omega t minus phi. So, the second term eventually condenses to this form where phi is equal to tan inverse of tau omega. So, let us now look at what is the final solution yt which will be the summation of the two Laplace inverses. So, it will be a k p times Laplace inverse of 1 plus Laplace inverse 2 which is a k p. times tau omega e raised to minus t over tau over 1 plus tau square omega square plus 1 over root 1 plus tau square omega square sin of omega t minus phi. So, this is the final response of a first order system to a sinusoidal input and you can see that it has two terms the first term is an exponentially decaying function. So, there are two parts to this response. So, this is exponentially decaying function So, as time t goes to infinity this part will go away and there is a repeating or a sinusoidal part to the solution. So, this is a sinusoidal part. which will remain irrespective of whether we look at a very long term response. So, if we look at uh, the response of this system after the initial exponential decay is over, so the long term response which is mathematically time t goes to infinity, what we have is y t is a k p 
over root of 1 plus tau square omega square sin of omega t plus phi. So, you can see that if we look at the response after some time when the exponential has decayed, uh, the output also oscillates uh, similar to an input with the same frequency. So, you can see that uh, the omega remains the same. So, what we can see is uh, the output has a certain amplitude which is different than the input and then output oscillates with the same frequency, but it lags the input by a phase angle of phi. So, if we if I write down the characteristic of this response, so you can say that it so output oscillates at the same frequency as input. has a different amplitude and it lags the input by a phase angle of phi. So, now let us try to look at uh, how this amplitude uh, comes up or what is the significance of this amplitude. So, we will define something known as an amplitude ratio. So, it is ratio of amplitude of output to amplitude of input which is a k p over root of 1 plus tau square omega square over the amplitude of input was a which is equal to k p over root of 1 plus tau square omega square. So, we can see that uh, the ampli output amplitude uh, depends directly on the k p. So, the larger is the gain of the system, uh, we will see a larger impact on the amplitude ratio, but we can also see that it is inversely proportional to the frequency. So, as the frequency of the input increases, uh, what we are going to see is that uh, the amplitude ratio substantially decreases. That is one of the reason why these systems are sometimes uh, used to reject very fast disturbances. So, we will try to see the impact of this particular phenomena uh, through a simulation. Earlier days, uh, simple uh, surge tanks were used to kind of uh, decouple different parts of a process so that a disturbance in one unit does not get propagated to the subsequent downstream unit. So, we will consider this example. So, let us say you have a reactor which is going to convert a reaction component A to B. So, at the output of the reactor uh, you will have unreacted A as well as some product B and typically it would eventually go to a separation unit let us say a distillation column which is going to separate these A and B. Now, typically uh, when this reactor operates, uh, this there will be changes, uh, the reactor would not operate exactly at the same concentration and there might be some fluctuations in the outlet at the reactor. These may be because of some changes in the feed condition or in the heating or cooling of the reactor or it may be that if it is a catalytic reaction, then the catalyst activity may degrade over time. So, it is quite possible that this outlet concentration from the reactor may not always come out to be exactly same as what is desired. However, this distillation column would be designed at to separate the component coming at that particular composition. If the reactor composition changes and if the same stream goes directly to the distillation column, then the distillation column will get affected by the changes in purity of the reactor. In order to avoid that and decouple this reactor as well as distillation column, simple surge tanks were introduced. So, a surge tank is nothing but a simple tank which will kind of act as a mixer. So, the output coming from reactor let us call it as CAI, it will go to this surge tank and whatever is the, it will mix with whatever amount which was present earlier in the surge tank and you will take out the mixed material out of it and pass it to the 
distillation column. So it is nothing but a simple mixer and if you try to write down the dynamics for this, what you would get is the way this concentration changes dCa over dt and let us say this is flow rate f, volume V which we are assuming to be constant, what we will get is which is a first order system. So let us simulate and uh, try to see what is the effect of frequency of CAI change on the change at the output of this particular system. So we have simulated this system and uh, what you can see is uh, we are going to pass some sinusoid uh, into the system as CAI and we will try to monitor uh, what do you get at the output. Now let me make it clear that uh, at steady state CAI will be equal to CA. So whatever is the concentration on an average that is gonna go into the uh, surge tank, the average composition coming out of the surge tank is going to be the same. So material balance will always get satisfied but we will just try to see how what is the effect of oscillations coming from the reactor and how do they get translated to the distillation column. So let us start with a very low frequency, uh, we will start with 0 0.001 radian per second and we will try to simulate uh, what is the output of this surge tank. What we will see is uh, there are in fact two lines, so the input and output are matching. So what you feed in as the input, same thing you are getting as the output. Now as you start increasing the frequency of oscillation, we we'll start noticing the effect of response of sinusoid to a first order process. So see there is a difference between what is input and what is output. So you can see that now the output is in yellow and the input is in blue. So you can see that the input oscillates at an amplitude of 0.1, however the amplitude of output is less than 0.1. So you can see that the effect of oscillation has dampened out. So if the reactor is oscillating between 0.9 and 1.1, the concentration changes seen by distillation are definitely smaller than that. So it is kind of suppressing the oscillations and the effect will get even more pronounced if we go to an even higher frequency, let us say 1 radian per second. And you will see that even though the input remains the same, the reactor outlet is oscillating between 0.9 and 1.1, but you can see that what distillation is going to see are much smaller variation amplitudes. So in a way, what we are seeing is that on an average, you can still see that the performance is same. So on an average, still the composition from the reactor is 1 and uh, composition going to the distillation column is 1, but you see that the variations are diminish significantly because of the use of this particular tank. And if you say if we go to frequency of 10, you will not be actually able to distinguish uh, and uh, if we reduce the time, so we can see that there is hardly any variation in the output of the surge tank which is going to the distillation column. So all that is happening uh, because uh, the, our result was that the ratio of amplitude between the output and the input is inversely proportional to the frequency or inversely proportional to omega. So a very high frequency oscillation the amplitude ratio will go to 0 whereas omega tends to infinity amplitude ratio will tend to 0 and that is what causes the suppression of these oscillations. So this tank somehow surges the oscillations, high frequency oscillations coming from the reactor. So that is why these are known as surge tanks and we had seen that if the frequency is very small, so if that frequency goes to 0, then amplitude ratio goes to 1. especially for this particular case, in general it will go to Kp and what you see that uh, all the 
high, uh, low, very low frequency oscillations which typically are some planned changes in the reactor, they would directly get carried to the distillation. So the whole purpose of this surge tank is that if you make any planned changes into your reactor, those changes will directly get transferred to the distillation column. However, if there are some unplanned changes, some fluctuations in the reactor, they would get suppressed by this surge tank. And this is kind of acting as a filter. So it is a filter which will reject anything which is of high frequency but allow anything which is of low frequency. That is why these first order processes are also known as low pass filters. So let us revisit the examples which we have considered. Uh, the first example was our surge tank uh, which was uh, purely capacitive process and there there was only one parameter Kp which was uh, the gain and we that is equal to the area of the tank. Uh, so the implication of that is if uh, it is it was 1 over A, so the larger the area of the tank smaller is the Kp and accordingly uh, what we had seen from the response is that uh, a step uh, input would give a linear response. So the larger the area smaller will be the gain and it will take a longer time to overflow. The next example was uh, the linear surge tank and there also the resistance, uh, the gain was equal to R which is the resistance of the wall. So the implication of that is if the wall is very restrictive, it is not going to allow the flow to go out of that tank easily, then a small change in the input flow will cause a much higher rise in the height. So that is the implication of having a larger Kp. When we looked at a nonlinear tank where the outlet flow rate was proportional to square root of the height, uh, we linearized the system and uh, we made uh, an assumption by linearizing that uh, the linearization approximation works as long as we are not moving too far away from the steady state around which we linearize. And what we got was the Kp dependent on the state at which we linearize. Now the implication of that is if we try to make predictions out of this linearized model. Uh, they will be very good uh, when we are close to the steady state. However, we move away from the steady state, these predictions will start to show some deviations. So again, we can see this from a simulation. So here I have a simulation uh, which compares the actual tank dynamics which are proportional where the outlet flow rate is proportional to square root of the height. And here is the linearized version of that around a steady state. And we give a same set, uh, step change to the input and we try to compare how do the two outputs look like. So what we can see that uh, there are two lines here, one from the exact response, nonlinear response and the other one is coming from the linearized response. So what we can see that the yellow is the linear, linearized response, so the gain uh, if we multiply the A times Kp, this is the predicted final change into the height and however what you can see uh, that uh, what you are getting is different than the actual response. The response starts to deviate from the linearized response because we are moving away from the steady state at which it was designed. In the case of uh, stirred tank heater, uh, our gain was 1 for input uh, T in, so what it tells me that if the input uh, there is an inlet temperature change of 1 degree, then the outlet temperature will also increase by 1 degree. So that is the importance of gain equal to 1. We also said, uh, saw that surge tank example, that example also has gain equal to 1. So all the changes in the input directly get carried out to the output. And lastly when we had a stirred tank heater with variable volume, uh, there were three effects in parallel. Uh, all of them were first order capacity, uh, one of them was T in which had unit gain and the uh, other gains uh, as we had linearized the system, those gains were also proportional to the steady state gain as well as time constant were dependent on the steady state around which they were we had linearized the system. So to summarize for this uh, week, uh, what we have seen is uh, first order systems are the simplest of the dynamical systems. Uh, they can be uh, represented by, uh, they generally represent a uh, a system which has a capacity to store either mass or energy especially for chemical engineering systems. Uh, they also can also have some resistance to this capacity building. If they do not have a resistance, we call them as purely capacitive processes. 
there are two parameters which uh, characterize a first order system. Uh, first is the input output gain which exactly tells uh, what is the magnification which is going to be added to the input change when we see look at the output. And uh, there is a time constant which kind of gives you the speed of response. Uh, if the time constant is very large the system behaves slowly and if the time constant is small the system responds very fast. And lastly through the response of a sin uh, response of first order system to a sinusoid and coupled with the example which we had seen about search tank what we could see is that these first order processes are kind of act uh, like a low pass filter if there are input changes at a very low frequency those changes get directly carried forward to the output but if the changes at the input are of very high frequency they will get rejected by the system and this is a very important phenomena uh, which uh, gets used uh, when we are uh, trying to decouple different parts of a process. Thank you.